In this video, we're reviewing offensive coaching rules, including those around base coaches, offensive conferences, and physically assisting a runner. We'll do this by examining the NFHS rules, breaking down several case plays, and reviewing some of the instructions given to minor league umpires for enforcing these rules. After that, we'll break down this week's case plays, and if you want to see how well you can do on the quiz before reviewing it with me, you can find a link to it in the video description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber from GHSA Baseball, Umpire Development, and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out the rest of our videos. Also, if you want next week's case plays emailed to you, there's a link in the description to sign up. Let's start by reviewing offensive conferences in Rule 3-4-2. Each team, when on offense, may be granted not more than one charge conference per inning to permit the coach or any of that team's personnel to confer with base runners, the batter, the on-deck batter, or other offensive team personnel. The umpire shall deny any subsequent offensive team requests for charge conferences. So this is pretty straightforward. They get one conference per inning, including one in each extra inning should we go past seven innings. Then, according to Rule 3-4-4, an offensive charge conference is concluded when the coach or team representative initially starts to return to the coach's box or dugout bench area. Now let's discuss base coaches and their positioning on the field. Rule 3-2-1. One player or coach may occupy each coach's box while the player or coach's team is at bat. A coach who is not in uniform of the team shall be restricted to the bench dugout. However, a coach may leave the bench dugout to attend to a player who becomes ill or injured. The coach may address base runners or the batter. Coaches may wear prosthetics and use mobility devices. Any member of the team at bat who has not been ejected for unsportsmanlike conduct may occupy a coach's box. This rule is pretty easy as well. They are allowed one coach or player to occupy each box and they have the option not to occupy a coach's box. But if they do, they are required to wear a proper uniform when on the field. Now, unlike other levels of baseball, high school baseball does not require base coaches to wear a helmet but you will see some coaches opt for a skull cap. What you do need to know though, is that players in the coach's box are still covered under equipment rule 1-5-1. It is mandatory for players, students, in the coach's boxes to wear a batting helmet that has a non-glare surface and meets the NOC SAE standard at the time of manufacture. The batting helmet shall have extended ear flaps that cover both ears and temples. So for a player coaching the bases, a skull cap will not be acceptable protection for them to be on the field make sure they're wearing a regular batting helmet. Now let's break down where the coach's boxes should be and their dimensions. You can find a diagram of these in rule 1-2. As you'll see, the box is located 15 feet from the foul line and extends 20 feet from the back edge of the base towards home plate. Then its depth is five feet. So now I've given you the dimensions and location of a coach's box per the rules, but the truth is, most likely, any field you work on, it will not have been drawn using any measurements and may not even have been put down. And for the most part, this is gonna be okay. The reason we covered this is to know the depth from fair territory and home plate, because in cases where the defensive team complains about a base coach trying to steal signs from the catcher, then we have a rule book location to restrict the base coach to. In situations where the box is not drawn on the field, we don't need to delay the game to have it put down unless a team complains about the positioning of a base coach from the other team. In that scenario, we would need to delay the game to have the home team lay down the coach's box. Now, in situations where the box is drawn incorrectly, we should follow the same principle of that it is not an issue until either coach complains. If a coach does decide to complain about the location of a coach's box, we may need to have it drawn again further from fair territory. Now, what do we do if a base coach is not standing in the box? The NFHS instructions don't cover enforcement procedures, so let's use the philosophy given in professional baseball. If a coach has positioned himself closer to home plate than the coach's box, or closer to fair territory than the coach's box before the batted ball passes the coach, the umpire shall, upon complaint by the opposing manager, strictly enforce the rule. The umpire shall warn the coach and instruct him to return to the box. If the coach does not return to the box, he shall be removed from the game. Otherwise, a coach shall not be considered out of the box unless an opposing manager complains, in which case the umpire shall strictly enforce the rule and require all coaches on both teams to remain in the coach's box at all times. So here are the major takeaways. If a coach is out of the box, we don't need to worry about it or do anything. The only times we will address it is if they are, in our opinion, too close to fair territory or the plate, or if the opposing coach complains. 
In the first scenario, it's not uncommon for a third base coach to position himself closer to home with a runner on second. This is so the runner can pick him up easier when determining if he should attempt to score. Generally, I would advise you to let an adult coach use their best judgment on their positioning. But if we have a student or player occupying the coach's box, I would then push them back towards the box. In the second situation, if a coach complains about another team's coach not being in the box, then we have no choice but to enforce the coach is in the box as drawn. But the key is that if we enforce it for one team, we will enforce it for both. Generally, once the complaining coach's team goes on offense, he'll regret the decision to complain and he won't do it in any other games, but for the remainder of that game, he'll be restrained to the box. Now, there is no penalty specified for violating this rule, but if we are requested to enforce the box, we use rule 10-1, which gives us the ability to carry out the enforcement of the rules. Using that rule, a coach that fails to follow our directions to get back in the box will be ejected. Now, let's talk about the box as it concerns the gameplay. Rule 3-2-3. The base coach or members of the team at bat shall not fail to vacate any area needed by a fielder in an attempt to put out a batter or runner. If a thrown live ball unintentionally touches a base coach in foul territory, the ball is live and in play. If the coach is judged by the umpire to have interfered intentionally with the thrown ball or interferes in fair territory, the interference penalty is invoked. The rule tells us that a base coach is obligated to follow the rules of authorized personnel. This means, so long as it is not intentional, his getting hit by a thrown ball will have no effect on the play. But if he intentionally interferes with a thrown ball or interferes with a fielder's attempt to get to a batted ball, then he has violated the rules regardless of if he is in or out of the coach's box. Finally, let's cover physical assistance from a base coach. Rule 3-2-2. No coach shall physically assist a runner during playing action. Penalty. The runner shall be called out immediately. From this, we need to be aware of a couple key points. First is that this is only illegal if it is during playing action. In a situation where we have a dead ball, such as a home run, there cannot be a violation of this rule. The second is that this is a time play, so as soon as it happens, we have the out. But the ball still remains alive and in play. The third point to this rule is be smart when you're calling this. The key is assistance. Did the contact benefit or could it have benefited the runner? So now that we've reviewed the rules, let's review this week's case plays. Case play number one. B1 hits a home run out of the park and while rounding third trips over the base. The third base coach helps B1 to his feet and he completes his award by touching home. Is this A, this is assisting, the batter runner is out, or B, this is legal, the run counts? The correct answer here is B. This is legal because the physical assistance occurs during a dead ball. Case play number two. Runners on second and third with one out. B3 hits a fly ball that bounces off the fence into play, as R3's coach at third physically assists R3 at third base. R3 and R2 score, B3 stays at first. Is this A, this is legal so long as the umpire believes the player would have scored without the assistance. B, this is illegal, at the end of playing action, R3 will be called out, R2's run counts, B3 stays at first. C, this is illegal and she'll be called immediately, R3 is out, R2 stays at second, and B3 is awarded first. Or D, this is illegal and she'll be called immediately, the ball remains live, and any subsequent outs or advances by runners she'll be allowed. The correct answer here is D. This is illegal, and remember, when we have physical assistance, it's an immediate out. However, the ball does remain live, so all other playing action that occurs will be allowed. But it's important to remember that this is an immediate out when it occurs. This could have been important had there been two outs when this play happens. Case play number three. The third base coach is accidentally hit by a thrown ball when standing in foul territory but out of the coach's box. Is this A, there is no penalty, the ball remains live. B, there is no penalty, the ball becomes dead. C, this is interference, the ball becomes dead. The correct answer here is A. There is no penalty for a base coach accidentally being hit by a thrown ball so long as he is still standing in foul territory. Whether or not he is in the coach's box will have no effect on this play. Case play number four. The third base coach is accidentally hit by a thrown ball when standing in fair territory. Is this A, there is no penalty, the ball remains live. B, there is no penalty, the ball becomes dead. Or C, this is interference, the ball becomes dead. The correct answer here is C. This is interference because he's in fair territory 
and the ball will become dead immediately. Case play number five. The third base coach is standing outside of the coach's box and further away from the plate in fair territory than the box. Is this A, this is illegal and should be enforced as soon as noticed by the umpires. B, this is not considered out of the box unless the opposing coach complains. Or C, this is not considered out of the box and is legal under all circumstances. The correct answer here is B. They are not considered out of the box unless the coach of the opposing team complains about it. In a situation where the opposing team's coach does complain that he wants the other coach to be in the coach's box, then we will have to enforce it, but remember, we're going to enforce it on both teams. Case play number six. The umpire in chief requests that the third base coach remain within the confines of the coach's box. However, the coach argues that he can be outside of the box since he is outside the line furthest from home plate. Is this A, the coach is correct, B, after a warning, the coach may be restricted to the dugout, or if warranted, ejected, C, the coach will immediately be ejected. The correct answer here is B. Generally, we don't need to enforce the coach's box, but if the opposing team's manager does complain about a coach being outside of the box, then we are going to have to enforce it. This could mean that a coach has to move closer to the plate in order to be in compliance with being in the box. But remember, when we make that order to a coach, it is a direction that we are giving and their failure to comply can result in a warning and possible ejection. Case play number seven. At the end of a half inning, the first base assistant coach leaves the coaching box to return to the third base dugout. While passing the plate umpire, the assistant coach stops for a quick discussion about a ruling. The coach commits no other 3-3-1F violation. Is this A, this is legal, or B, this is not legal and the assistant coach may not approach an umpire to discuss a play. The correct answer here is A. The assistant coach has to leave his position in the coach's box when his team goes on to defense, so if he naturally comes by the umpire, this isn't any deviation from where he needs to be. In general, talking with and explaining a ruling to an assistant coach can be helpful down the road when that coach goes on to become a head coach. Help them understand the rules so long as they're asking in an appropriate manner. Case play number eight. Between innings, the coach of team A walks from the third base coach's box to the pitcher's mound and proceeds to visit with F1. Is this A, this is a defensive conference for not going back to the dugout immediately. B, this is not a conference so long as he does not discuss strategy. B, this is not a conference so long as he does not discuss strategy. Or C, this is not a conference so long as he does not delay the start of the next inning. The correct answer here is C. So long as he does not delay the start of the next inning, this is not considered a defensive conference. Case play number nine. A bench player for the visiting team is coaching first base while his team is on offense. He is wearing a skull cap helmet. Is this legal? The correct answer here is that this is not legal. If we have a player that is coaching the bases, they must wear a legal helmet, which requires that the ears be covered. Case play number 10. Which of the following is the offensive conference rule? A, the offense is awarded one conference per inning. B, the offense may use three conferences throughout a regulation game and receive one additional conference per extra inning. They may use as many as they want per inning. C, the offense may use three conferences throughout a regulation game and receive one additional conference per extra inning. They may only use one per inning. The correct answer here is A. The offense is awarded one conference per inning. So there you have it, our review of offensive coaching rules in NFHS baseball. If you found this video helpful, please share our videos with other umpires. And also you can help me produce more content by sending your game pictures and videos to media at umpireclassroom.com. Thanks again for watching. And as always, I look forward to seeing you on the field.